Well, thank you very, very much, and uh, that was a really nice introduction, and I um, have to um, start a little bit along the lines of where you left off where David is concerned, because um, this room is full of a number of, or fi uh, there are a number of people in this room with whom among us there are close associations, but David's and mine goes back the longest of all of them. And so I congratulate you on this symposium being devoted to you. Thank you very much for including me in it. Um, but, um, uh, but I must say that the relationship, the uh, work that David and I have done together over many, many years uh, has been, you know, just extraordinarily rewarding and very, very um, uh, uh, important part of both of our professional lives, I think. It did begin in 1979 when we, he, David was at the State Department, I was at the Justice Department. We were young at that time. And uh, uh, we worked together on uh, uh, part of a small staff group in the executive branch that produced the Refugee Act of 1980. And as he made reference to just earlier this morning, it was one of those things that was just a huge accomplishment. It was an amazing reform, a real step forward. And six weeks later, the Mariel boat lift happened <laughs> after it was signed, and all of the and 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 really revealed what some of the weaknesses were uh, that we hadn't been able to think ahead and prepare for. But that, of course, is the name of the game. That is the way public policy is. It is the way being in government is, and it is certainly the way that immigration is. Um, but, um, but there are a couple of other close associations here that I want to mention uh, uh, in terms of the sort of a sentimental journey that is taking place today. Uh, the next one is John Morton. I met John Morton here at UVA when he was a third year, and we were seated next to each other at a very elegant dinner in the rotunda. Uh, after a law school event that probably uh, David Martin arranged uh, for me to be here for. And um, uh, John then came to INS as his first job after law school uh, as a young trial attorney. He moved very quickly and uh, soon left INS and became part of the Deputy Attorney General's Office in the Justice Department and part of a team that exercised oversight over INS. And so very quickly, uh, this young kid that I had met a couple of years ago at a law school dinner is sitting at a table with the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General asking me on a week to week basis whether we had done this or that or something else. Um, and it reminds me of uh, uh, it reminds reminds me of a truism that one of my favorite colleagues always has, which is when you're working with young people, he always says, "Be good to your interns. You never can tell. In a few moments, they will become your program officer at your favorite foundation." <laughs> And that, of course, does happen. It happens a lot, and that's what we love to see happen with students and young people. But it certainly was the beginning of a long, uh, fruitful relationship with John that has that went through the Clinton administration and then uh, uh, during the period that he was at ICE. Um, but um, uh, then there's also Bo Cooper. And uh, Bo Cooper is here, and um, Bo and I go back to the mid-90s, and I was pleased to be able to select Bo as a general counsel uh, at INS uh, some period after David had served as general counsel. And whenever I see Bo Cooper, I don't think I've ever said this to you directly, Bo, I'm going to say it now, um, I have to think about the fact that, um, you know, in in the community and in the worlds that we live in, there's something known as the Meissner Memo, um, which has generally been well regarded. Uh, it was the um, uh, it was the first real articulation after the '96 Act of prosecutorial discretion and what the uh, contours of prosecutorial discretion were, uh, based on the notion that in general people thought the '96 Act got rid of prosecutorial discretion, and that memo um, uh, really should have been called the Cooper Memo um, because it was Bo's work, it was brilliant work, it has stood the test of time. It was a very, very important contribution, and um, I sure love to get credit for it, but Bo is the person that should get credit for it. So um, that's, you know, been uh, an association that has gone over the years as well, and um, 
Uh, and there are others. Uh, I mean, the, the well, just to close the circle on that. So that memo really lasted throughout the 2000s. And to go full, for full circle has now been supplanted by, of course, by the Morton memo. <laughs> and so John is really the lord of prosecutorial discretion land, uh, uh, which is also part of the family. Uh, but Christina Rodriguez is a non-resident fellow uh, at MPI, uh, Hiroshi, uh, uh, Steve, um, Dan to some extent. We've all worked together on one thing or another over the years. So there's a group of people here that really um, have a lot of personal history. We've had a lot of discussion and debate among us over many, many issues over many years. We've shared writing, we've shared fora, we've shared uh, professional uh, uh, ups and downs, and um, and it's really been a highly productive effort. It's the kind of uh, it's the kind of people and the kind of ways that you want to spend with people as you go through your uh, through your professional life. So, in that spirit of solving problems together, of thinking together, of trying to be productive in confronting challenges. Um, I want to talk today about some things that I've been thinking about uh, that have to do with border enforcement, and I want to do them as a thought exercise. I want to say at the outset that this is not a finished product. Uh, this is by no means uh, um, something that, uh, that, that I'm completely persuaded of, but I want to share some thoughts that, 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 that I think need to be part of the enforcement debates that we've had. Uh, I think the enforcement debates that we've been having over the years have gotten increasingly dry and, uh, 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 and, and circular, and it seems to me that there are new factors that are coming into play. Um, based on new realities that we're dealing with externally, and so those are the things I want to try out. Okay, well, I'd like to begin by looking at um, some of the long-term trends here that are very important. The uh, uh, place that I would start is to say that I think it is the case that the era of large-scale unauthorized migration from Mexico is over. And it's over, not because we don't still have migration from Mexico, we do. But at the end of the day, the large scale illegal immigration that we've been experiencing for four decades, um, uh, since the early 1970s, has basically abated. Um, we've now, we've had no net new illegal immigration from Mexico for more than five years, possibly six or seven, depending on how you count. Now, that is not at all well understood. It is certainly not generally accepted. Um, and as I say, there still are crossers, but those crossers and the, the, the uh, uh, low numbers of apprehensions are really a historic shift from what has been the pattern and the habit at the southwest border since the 1970s. We have minimal first-time crossers at the southern border. More and more, although the data are still uncertain on this, crossers tend to be people that are repeat crossers, largely because their families are in the United States or their jobs are in the United States. And that shift has come about for a set of reasons that are uh, uh, long-term structural as well as things that we've actually done. Now, the long-term structural reasons have to do with significantly reduced fertility in Mexico. Mexico's fertility rates now have fallen to the level of those in the United States. Um, uh, this is no longer a country where the age curve is predominantly under 15 and the majority of the population is advancing into the labor market. It is a country that has a much more evened out demographic picture. And in 10 to 15 years from now, we're going to start to be talking about Mexico as a, as a country of aging and a country that has issues of aging. So that's a major structural change. <clears throat> We also, of course, have what happened in the United States, which was a deep recession 
in um, uh, 2007, eight, and um, that recession dramatically reduced the job pull of people, particularly low wage people from Mexico workers into the United States. And even though we're pulling out of that recession, our own job picture has changed. And there is no, or there is every reason to believe that we will not be returning to the kind of an economy that was generating the hundreds of thousands of jobs and job opportunities that were filled by that uh, uh, Mexican migration. We also have seen very steady economic growth in Mexico. It's a little bit flat right now, but Mexico's economic growth over the last 15 plus, almost 20 years actually, has been steady and has been uh, sustainable, uh, sustained. And it's because they made some basic adjustments in their economy, opened their economy through NAFTA and then other internal changes that they did in the 1990s that got their fundamentals right. And they've been actually seeing the benefits of that. And one of the major benefits of that has been the growth of a middle class, a real middle class in Mexico. Now, Mexico has a long way to go on a lot of fronts. But countries that begin to have vibrant middle classes are different kinds of countries. And they are countries that require accountability, that uh, uh, buy populations from their governments. You're beginning to see that in Mexico. You're seeing now the kinds of reforms in this current administration that are really sweeping uh, across Mexico's economy, the most recent being the energy reform, which may, will make a very, very big difference in the kind of a country that Mexico is. So those are things that are structural that have happened um, uh, uh, both in Mexico and in the United States that are longer term. The fourth thing that has happened that's very important that changes this migration picture from Mexico is U.S. enforcement. Because U.S. enforcement at the border and in general has been a critical factor in changing the picture where Mexican migration is concerned. Um, it's particularly been, of course, border enforcement and what are now essentially zero tolerance policies at the border. So I want to look a little deeper at that enforcement part of the overall set of things that have changed where Mexican migration is concerned. And I would say that that enforcement picture basically has three very important elements. The first is the 96 law and the changes that the 1996 law brought about uh, as a statutory framework for enforcement. Uh, the second is resources and the incredible uh, uh, sustained staffing and technology for immigration enforcement that has been brought in. And the third has been policies and strategies that the immigration enforcement agencies have put into place. So, on the first one, the 1996 Act. The 1996 Act um, uh, was a very, very strong enforcement-oriented piece of legislation. Uh, it limited the grounds for removal, and it greatly expanded administrative authorities for deporting people in non-judicial Man, in, through non-judicial means by enforcement personnel, and those means essentially have been expedited removal and the ability to use reinstatement of, um, of, of prior deportation orders. So you have a different statutory landscape post-96 than had been the case really throughout our immigration history prior to that time. Um, the next very important issue has been appropriations and has been resources. Now, the appropriations and the resources uh, began coming into place in the 1990s, but it's really the post-9-11 period that is the resource story. And the post-9-11 period, where resources are concerned, gives just stunning numbers. ICE and CBP, the two primary immigration enforcement agencies, have grown by 300% in their resources in the last 12 or so years. That 
translates to a very, very big dollar amount. The dollar amount for those two agencies is $18 billion. And in order to put that into perspective, that represents 24% more than the funding for all other federal criminal law enforcement combined, which means the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, the Secret Service, and the US Marshal Service. That's a lot of resources. Um, those resources have been heavily personnel, but they also have been extraordinarily um, uh, ex extraordinary infusions of technology and integrated data systems. And the data systems and the availability of data and integration of data at the federal level, again, very much an outgrowth of, po of the post-9-11 era and thinking and change in the way we view the role of government, have been pivotal where immigration enforcement is concerned. So then the law, the appropriations, then you have agency policies. Now where the agency policies are concerned, what we see across three administrations is remarkable continuity. Beginning at the end of the 1990s with the uh, post-96 Act, through the Bush, Bush administration, and now uh, uh, well into the Obama administration. There are some differences, but in general, the story is a story of continuity. And what that continuity has brought about is a point where we now know that there have been about 4.5 million people deported from this country since 1996, since the 96 Act. The number was given earlier today, uh, I think by Steve, I think, in it, it, which is that um, uh, last year, this past year, 2013, is the highest of all in any particular year, 438,000 deportations in one year. That's a shift from, I mean, that level of deportations compares with just 70,000 um, prior a, a year prior to the 96 Act. So there are incredible, as you said, orders of magnitude change here in the pace of deportations. Um, but the way that those deportations are carried out represents perhaps as interesting or even more interesting a shift because the shift has been Fundamental. It's been a shift from removing people through informal methods, um, typically voluntary return and departure, to formal methods of removal. And the significance of formal methods of removal have been that people who are formally removed from the country, not formally, formally <laughs> removed from the country, um, become ineligible for a visa to return to the country, and they become subject to reinstatement um, uh, of removals or uh, criminal charges if they come back to the country or are again found it through an enforcement action of one sort or another. So that rise in formal removals comes as a result of these new authorities in the 96 Act, expedited removal and reinstatement. Those are the non-judicial forms of removal. They have grown enormously. Um, uh, prior to 1996, there were about 1,400 a year. Today, there are about uh, uh, 313,000 of those 438,000 removals every year. They represent 75% of all of the deportations as compared to 3% of the deportations prior to 96 when deportations were done by immigration judges. The border mirrors that. Because at the border, even as recently as 2005, the basic metier was voluntary return. Voluntary return were really represented about 82% of people that were returned from the border. Today, that has fallen to about 20%. There's almost no humanitarian return, I mean, a voluntary return that takes place uh, at the southwest border. Now, the reasons for this shift have been uh, uh, to reduce recidivism, to gain control of the border, uh, to pursue border enforcement in the way that the public and the Congress has demanded. Um, but as a result, we see that formal non-judicial removals are really the centerpiece of enforcement, immigration enforcement, uh, uh, especially at the border and 
in furtherance of the overall political demand to secure the border first. Well, what that is, is a picture of enforcement agencies using to the very, very fullest all of the authorities that are in their toolbox. And that use to the fullest extent of the authorities that have been available and for which resources have generously been supplied has gotten enforcement results. The data definitely show that recidivism is dramatically reduced. Um, and the issue, as was commented this morning in the, in the panel as well, the issue of concern about the border, concern about border control had been receding things were getting reasonably quieter on that front. And that became reflected also in our politics because the best example, I think, uh, of it is Senator McCain, who stepped forward in 2013 and became a sponsor, along with several others, of broad immigration reform based on the statement that although he is a hawk on border enforcement, he was persuaded that border enough progress had been made in border enforcement to make it possible to entertain other kinds of ideas where immigration policy was concerned. That was a very big shift. Polling backed it up. Polling showed the public more and more uh, uh, reconciled to the fact that border enforcement was occurring and ready, even though with some disagreement, nonetheless ready to entertain ideas like legalization and broader immigration reform. Well, that has been the picture until very recently. What happened? Well, what happened was the child migrant crisis, uh, which peaked this summer and was building all last year. This year, this past year, 2013, we saw 68,000 children unaccompanied coming across the southwest border and um, from the countries of Central America, the Northern Triangle countries as they're known, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And that crisis, humanitarian emergency, whatever term we want to give it, um, has opened up the whole question of border security yet again. Um, it's been seen as a failure of border enforcement. It's, it's been seen and um, understood to be <clears throat> a vulnerability on the part of the United States. I myself think that's a complete misread of what the real issue has been. Because this has not been a failure of border enforcement. These children coming across the southwest border have been looking to find the Border Patrol so that they can turn themselves in in order to be beneficiaries of a hearing in the United States and largely the ability to be reconnected with family members. More than 80% of these children have either a parent or a close family member in the United States and because of separate statutory provisions that apply to them, they have the ability to come into the country, have an immigration hearing, have claims for humanitarian relief be heard, and for the vast majority of them during that period of time, placed with family members. So this is not people trying to evade enforcement, trying to make their way through dangerous uh, uh, desert climates and so on. It is people that are trying to get to the United States for different reasons under a different set of statutory protections. Now there's a lot more that can be said on that issue and we can have a whole discussion about it that is important and is interesting. I'm, I, uh, well, I raise it not to get into all those issues, all of which are very legitimate and about which there is controversy as there is with everything else in immigration. Um, but I raise it because of what it shined a light on. What the child migrant issue this summer shined a light on was that one part of the enforcement system that has been outside of, 
beyond the bounds of this enormous amount of investment and this enormous amount of change that has taken place in our enforcement system. That has been, of course, our judicial proceedings and our immigration courts because these child migrants are processed through immigration judges as compared to all of the other things that I just described that are taking place in immigration enforcement. And so you have a situation where this one sliver of the system that represents the judicial function um, uh, has not gotten the attention and has not changed and most importantly has not gotten any of proportionally the kinds of resources that the rest of the enforcement system has uh, uh, garnered in order to do its work. And yet that small sliver um, and the inability of that sliver of the system to respond effectively over time has brought in, really brought enforcement to its knees and it's badly shaken public confidence and perceptions in the effectiveness of border enforcement overall. Um, and the question is why? Uh, why would this be the case? Well, I think there are a couple of answers. Uh, one of the answers, uh, I think, has to do with a far too slow response on the part of federal agencies and the administration overall, either operationally or in terms of policy, where this flow was concerned. I mean, after all, 68,000 child migrants is a large number, and it represented a big uptick over the prior year, 70%, but it is not a huge number where an emergency is concerned. I mean, we have had humanitarian emergencies. We will continue to have them. It's in the nature of immigration that things like this can occur. It's been, of course, particularly acute and sympathetic that these are unaccompanied children. But nonetheless, emergencies are something that you do in immigration and that you need to be able to do. So how it is that our federal agencies kind of lost, or seemingly, have lost the muscle memory of what it is to respond to issues like this um, uh, is, uh, you know, it, it, it is hard to understand. More deeply, or at least as a corollary to that, is the issue of the court system. And the court system as the failing in this circumstance as compared with border enforcement and the enforcement machinery that um, uh, has been put into place where Mexican migration has been concerned. I'm going to just give you a couple numbers now on the um, on this court question because it really is dramatic. I mean, I told you earlier that CBP and ICE had grown by about 30, 300% since 9-11. 300% as compared to 70% percent growth in the immigration court system over that period of time. Our immigration judge backlog at the present time nationally stands at 408,000 cases. That's 408,000 cases for 227 judges. 227 judges in the system. There are 1,700 cases per judge if you even it out across uh, the system. Now it's uneven because there are far higher caseloads in certain locations than in others. But it's really a completely indefensible uh, setup where, um, uh, uh, where really important decisions need to be made, particularly decisions on child migrants where there are, you know, under the most vulnerable kinds of circumstances for a judge, courtroom, uh, adversarial proceedings, all of that sort of thing. Now, um, the, um, uh, so, so you have this complete bottleneck, and the response has been to change the priority given to child migrants in an effort to send a signal uh, to try to deter this flow. But from what I can tell, and from having heard a few judges talking about this, 
it really isn't much of a change at all. The change has been that child migrants are now on the detained docket, uh, which means that they are to get first or early consideration. What I think that sorts out to is that they get their first hearing, master calendar hearing, in 21 days. That's the requirement. Um, and then, in all cases, they're being given continuances and then uh, uh, scheduled for a hearing down the road. I heard a number the other day about San Francisco. That hearing on the merits in San Francisco is being scheduled now for August of 2018. So that's what we mean by a complete bottleneck and an inability of the court part of our enforcement system to in any way pull its weight or function. Well, where do we go with that? What does that tell us? I think um, that first it's important to say that this child migrant crisis may very well not be over at all. There is certainly been an abatement in the numbers. The numbers have definitely gone down. The issue is off of the front pages. The agencies have been coping with processing these children placing them. I don't think that there are any more in custody. The custody issue is something that Margaret and I were talking about. There is a whole custody issue here too, but it has to do with children that come with mothers, uh, generally with mothers, um, who are being uh, detained. But where children themselves are concerned that have come unaccompanied, that has now quieted down. But the basic fundamentals that generated this flow are absolutely still in place, uh, including the part of it in the United States that has to do with, as I just said, delayed hearings very many years down the road, and in the meanwhile, placement with families and the safety and possibilities of future that go with that. So it's highly likely that this flow will rise again. It may not rise to these levels, but there probably is a new normal here where child migration from Central America is concerned. And I think the best that we can hope, or let's, you know, as, as some have often said, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste, this crisis, this emergency does really need to be seen as a reason to think more carefully and to think more broadly about the new challenges that face our enforcement system. So that if large-scale unauthorized migration from Mexico really has waned and is not going to be the same kind of pattern that we've seen for 40 years, what will the newer patterns be? And child migration from Central America may very well be an important part of new patterns. Um, we, we all, in the face of these kinds of challenges, turn to, we need immigration reform. That is always the answer. We know that's the answer. We know we need immigration reform. But I'd like to say that I don't think that that is in the offing. Even if it is in the offing, it's not until 2017 at the soonest. And when you look, not even deeply, even somewhat more carefully at the politics of what has kept immigration reform from happening and what is politically the trajectory in 2017 and after, it is entirely possible that we will not have a Congress that can enact immigration reform until the 2000s. Now that is a long time away. And we have a lot that has to, we've got to open the store every day, as people like John and others who have been responsible for agencies uh, uh, know is the case. So we've got to work with what we have more effectively than we've been able to do, which is not to say that we don't need immigration reform, and it's not to say that it wouldn't be just fantastic if that sort of dire uh, uh, prediction uh, does not come true. Nonetheless, as a planning assumption, it's important to recognize that immigration reform is not saving us, and it may not save us for some while. So 
<clears throat> we've got to focus on better rationalizing the system that we have and treating it in the way that I've just said, system, as a system. It is a system that has a whole set of connected parts. And those parts have to be coherent. They have to be reasonably seamless operationally in order to actually get the results that we need as compared with where we are to some extent right now, and that is with much more autonomous parts that are each self-maximizing as compared to having a more integrated response. And the you know best example of that is what I just gave. How can you possibly have a court part of an immigration system that is so totally under-resourced as compared to what the rest of the system is pouring into that teeny little um, uh, uh, channel? Well, so let me give you some ideas on some of the things that I think we need to be thinking about mm -hmm. that perhaps give us some possibilities. This current caseload of children could be a catalyst for some better ways of thinking about representation. People have really come to the fore in an effort to try to provide representation for these children. And some money is finally being put into it by EOR, by, by, the, by the immigration court system itself, has put $2 million into AmeriCorps to try to create a group of lawyers that will represent these children in 15 cities. Let's look at that. Let's really understand what a difference that might make. It's been clear for a long time that cases where there's representation, totally apart from the overriding issue of fairness and of um, uh, uh, values that we you know, embrace as a society where due process is concerned and so on, that representation is efficient. It makes cases move more quickly. It's more cost effective at the end of the day when cases are represented. They get decided, the issues get out on the table, decisions can be made. So under the current circumstances where there is, it looks like, going to be fairly substantial representation, at least in some places, of some numbers, let's find out how much of a difference that makes, because maybe that can be a model for the future, at least in vulnerable situations, that helps our system. Another thing to think about is um, the various roles of the various agencies. We talk about the enforcement agencies, CBP, um, uh, ICE. USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, has an incredibly important role here. It's USCIS that deals with and has the responsibility for asylum and asylum claims. And asylum claims, of course, are the humanitarian part of this whole flow. These flows from Central America are mixed flows. We have had mixed flows. We will always have mixed flows, but they're particularly acute under these circumstances given the country conditions that we know exist in Central America. But they are mixed flows. They're not entirely one. They're not entirely the other. And that is work that needs to be done um, through screening and through expertise that we have at USCIS. Um, but for some reason, the, the, that kind of expert, robust, upfront screening has not been put into place. I don't know the reason. Um, um, I'm told that the credible fear screening has become quite encumbered and perhaps broken. The asylum system itself is something that several of us are very acquainted with. <laughs> David and I, others, have spent a lot of time uh, 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 in the 1990s creating an asylum system that became a jewel in the crown of the immigration system. Worked extremely well. Is it still working well? I don't know. But if it isn't, then let's figure out what it takes because we know how to make it work, and it's absolutely essential to dealing with these kinds of enforcement challenges uh, into the future. Um, we've got to know much more about, um, uh, we've, got, we've got to get much better at this, the asylum part of all of this because this violence in Central America is probably a new normal for us where immigration is concerned. And then think about what's actually happening in Mexico. 
as compared with the picture that I just painted about all of the progress in Mexico, 23 students have probably, what well, you know the whole story. There is a, still a lot of violence in Mexico. What if Mexican violence in certain parts of Mexico becomes a push factor for some degree of a different kind of a migration from Mexico? We've got to be able to think about those possibilities and be in a better state of preparation for them. Um, so, um, then we get, of course, to the bigger whole of government solutions, which are very difficult, but which are very necessary in this regard. One of them, I think, has to do with the IJ system overall and whether it should be rethought entirely. Certainly, it ought to be looked at from a regulatory standpoint, as between DHS and DOJ. Are there regulatory changes that can be made that would make even the very minimal resources that are devoted to it now at least be able to work more effectively. But more broadly, should the immigration judge system even be an administrative system? Should it even be part of the executive branch or in the Justice Department? Or should it be an Article I court? That's an issue that has come up again and again. I don't know the answer to it, but these are the kinds of strains and these are the kinds of challenges that seem to me to beg a look at some of those issues in order to really determine whether we need to be on a different path where the court functions in immigration are concerned. And then, of course, you get to the really big questions, which have to do with these countries themselves and our geographical neighborhood. I mean, these are countries that are in our region. And the deeper causes for this kind of migration comes from the conditions in those countries. Mexico had to change internally to some great extent in order for the Mexican picture to change. These countries are going to have to change dramatically in order for this overall set of factors creating this kind of a migration to change as well. But when you look at it, their economies and their societies are, by, are beset by violence because of their geography, but largely because it's tied to drugs and the demand for drugs is not in their countries, it's in this country. Um, in addition to that, we now have thousands, no, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of divided families, binational families, close, direct families where parts are in the region, parts are in the United States, and there is no practical way, even for relatively smaller numbers, uh, to have family reunification under the stalemate that we are in, in terms of US law at this time. The opportunity for livelihoods and for safety in home countries is certainly a primary responsibility for these countries, but it's also an interest that the United States has in having happen in those countries because of the way that we are tied together on migration issues. So the question is, what's our shared responsibility? Uh, what is our shared responsibility with and as part of the region when we have circumstances that we see that are then connecting us in these ways through migration. So those are some reflections on the, 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 the journey that we've undertaken as a country over the last 10, 15, 20 years to try to bring our enforcement up to speed, to try to have a modern, effective enforcement system. We've come a very long way in getting to that kind of a modern, effective enforcement system. And yet, at the same time, it seems to me that the next frontier really has to be debates and solutions on the kinds of issues that I've talked about that seemingly are beyond the realm of enforcement, but that are absolutely essential if enforcement overall, longer term, really is going to be effective. Thank you very much. <laughs>